Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, and welcome everyone to this session. My name is Simon Maple uh, and today, yes, we're going to be talking about AI hallucinations and manipulation. Um, so let's uh, let's jump in. Um, joining me today, Laran Tal, uh, Director of Developer Ad Advocacy. Laran, how are you? All good, Simon. Happy to join you. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure presenting with you. So looking forward to, to today. Uh, my name's Simon Maple. I'm uh, head of AI advocacy at uh, at Sneak. We're both colleagues at Sneak. And in fact, you're on the JavaScript uh, side and I'm on the Java side. So uh, so welcome to the Java side for a, a, about an hour or so. And then you can go back to, to JavaScript. Amazing. <laughs> so uh, today uh, we're going to be talking about AI, as uh, as mentioned. First of all, uh, Loran is going to give uh, an introduction to AI, tell tell us a little bit about how it's used in development today, uh, and then we're going to talk about, um, or, or rather, jump straight into some code and show you a coffee shop being built with generative uh, AI. Uh, with Copilot specifically, and we're going to live hack that and show you how vulnerabilities jump into that code and how we can uh, extract it from that code as well, and follow up with a little bit of a conclusion in the learnings and takeaway. Uh, as mentioned, today is very, very interactive, so feel free, please, to uh, to let us know uh, maybe where you're from, what you do in the chat, and uh, as we go through discussions and Q&A can, uh, can be done through both the Q&A and the discussions in the chat. So, Laran, over to you. Awesome. Let's get us started. So uh, you've probably heard about AI LLMs uh, in the in, in the past few months. It's uh, it's a you know very hot topic. Uh, generative AI specifically has been something that developers have been using uh, in recent times to basically code faster, ship faster, basically has speed up the entire delivery process. Uh, one of those things that we've uh, seen more and more is uh, is a lot of views around things like you know GitHub Copilot and uh, and ChatGPT and all of these things. And so if we take a second just to like uh, reflect on the usage there, right? So some studies like AWS and GitHub show that uh, it contributes to 55 more uh, percentage more of like an increase of productivity for developers using AI. We see developers uh, who are using AI are 27% uh, more likely to basically complete the task, a coding task that they get uh, with the use of AI tools, like those kind of tools that we mentioned, maybe others as well. Uh, GitHub's, uh, based on GitHub study, we also see that 92% of US developers are already using AI in their you know day-to-day -day tasks as well. So this is definitely uh, you know a hot topic around. And so what are the security nightmare? What are the issues that we're actually bringing up? And I actually want to start this up with with a poll. So we'll get a poll uh, coming up. Basically, how do you feel about security when we relate that to AI, right? To LLMs, to using those kind of tools to speed up all of your de delivery of code. Uh, are you feeling much more secure using AI than the code that you write, you know, moderately less or much less? Um, maybe it's as secure as you write. So I'll give you, you know, a few seconds here, uh, go through this, choose the ones. Uh, well, uh, I, I can't vote myself, uh, which is a problem here, I guess, but I also don't want to uh, be a bit biased here. So let's see. Um, give it a few more seconds. All we know what is it's magic. Whether it's more secure or less secure, it's magic. <laughs> Magic that uh, we need to worry about. <laughs> Start to like like uh, like obstructions in software. Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, so uh, we'll get the results uh, a few seconds in. Uh, just completed. Let's see. All right. Cool. So uh, mo everyone got. Uh, oh, the most one is moderately less secure than the code I write with thirty six percent. As secure as the code I write, uh, as a good second best with 33%, so about a third of us uh, reply that. And then uh, much more secure, moderately more secure, uh, less, which is very interesting. I love this. Uh, you're all probably uh, quite on point on, on this. So let's talk more, more about this, Simon, and, and you know, talk about the fact that uh, what's, what's the actual issue here, right? Like, and the poll uh, status is very much related to this. Essentially, uh, you know, to cite some studies on this as well, uh, the new uh, NYU saw 40% uh, of uh, co-pilot code creating more vulnerabilities. So it kind of like asks the question is, you know, do developers trust more or less AI, right? Uh, if you trust, if you put more trust into AI, potentially this could be alarming because you're putting a lot of trust in something that uh, essentially might give you uh, less secure code. Another study from Stanford 
found developers that uh, do use AI produce much less secure code than developers with AI. So that is uh, also uh, very much relatable to those poll results that we just saw. So given all of this, let's talk about some other aspects of AI. And this is the topic of hallucination, which is basically the fact that uh, using AI is, is probably something that we know happens, but the way that we use it and its output is, is much more of, of, of a concern for us. One of these is AI hallucinations, which essentially means that we potentially uh, ask a question and get the very, very wrong answer back. So for example, uh, in this study, we asked, uh, uh, we asked uh, you know, ChatGPT to create, to solve a very simple math problem, five times uh, nine plus four times three, uh, give us the answer, uh, which is uh, answered as uh, 51. Um, for those of you uh, who are uh, trying to do a quick math here, this is an incorrect answer. Uh, we asked again, and it is uh, given an explanation, and we asked the AI if it's sure about this, uh, and it replied, you know, of course it is. So it's very confident, but on something that is very wrong on which is something, again, alarming that we kind of like have to understand. So this is one hallucination where AI just makes things up, um, you know, based on uh, whatever the data is. We see other examples of this, you know, beyond just chat GPTs. For example, there's been a lawyer who was uh, using chat GPT for different uh, uh, legal research, like, you know, researching precedents and stuff like that, uh, now facing uh, sanctions uh, or being uh, revoked from the bar. Uh, Australia uh, saw this incident of uh, the mayor that actually uh, filed the uh, a defamation lawsuit against it. And so all of these, uh, all of these set of essential uh, AI hallucinations and different issues uh, show us that AI can be wrong, uh, but of course it doesn't know that it's wrong and that's a problem. So where does that leave us in terms of code, right? Because we do use AI, and this is the concept. This is, you know, the very much uh, uh, topic of using AI with code. And here we care about the code being, you know, performant and all of those kind of things, but also secure. So it doesn't actually create new vulnerabilities, new code security issues. So how do you use that uh, in a day-to-day? -day is an important one, and we're gonna di deep dive into a whole coding sessions right now with Simon. So to get started, what we want to do here with Simon is. Uh, use the Java app, we're going to use Spring Boot to basically, we have a few tasks here and we'll uh, do those with you to basically code a simple application and we'll use AI to uh, to do it. And through that session, through this whole process, we'll uh, go ahead and see how vulnerabilities are created and exploit them together with you so you can also understand those uh, aspects. So uh, let's get started with the actual technical stuff here to kind of like very quickly review what's going on. So first off, we're going to have this uh, homepage, which we're going to have uh, a list of beers. So these are going to be our products, how much they cost and everything. Um, we're going to be able to, uh, we're going to have a repository. So if you can take us to the repository, Simon, we're going to see uh, where we have, uh, um, there we go. So this is our code. Uh, we're going to be able to... Yeah, so this is this is where it's hosted. You can also uh, use it after this uh, this session. Uh, we are going to create. Uh, should we create a new branch here, Simon? What do you think? Yeah, let's create a new branch. I'm gonna I'm gonna um uh let's say let's say uh, Linux Foundation uh branch where we're gonna do our feature branch uh, under my under my name there. So I'll create that branch, and there we go. That branch has just been created. Sounds good. Let's go back to, into uh, the IDE now. We're going to use IntelliJ. This is a Java app, Spring Boot based. Uh, Simon is going to check out this uh, new branch and then switch to it where we have all of those, uh, all of that new code that we're going to add over there. And once we get over to the branch, we're going to see the files that we have. And there we go. And what uh, Simon already has open is you can see under resources templates, we have this index.html file, which is uh, where our app is presenting the contents. Uh, if you open that up on the browser, just so we see what's happening, you can see the body is pretty empty. And that is why when we load this up, there is nothing really happening there. So our first uh, very immediate task is going to be to, uh, you know, we have, we've completed this uh, create homepage task. Amazing. Um, I'm going to take a lot of pride of that because I'm not a Java developer and already got this completed as well. <laughs> well, the whole page is created, but it, it's actually kind of a little bit empty. So kind of like what we want to be able to do here is create a top banner and a product listing table within this page. So we want to actually be able to add some content here uh, so that it actually looks uh, looks pretty good. Right. So maybe I'll, I'll prompt you and give you a okay. story here, uh, Simon. Uh, how about that? Right. OK, let's, let's do that. Let's do that. So go to the body there, and I want you to basically add a fragment called header. 
Okay, let me get rid of these. So you want me to add a fragment called header. So uh, a couple of things that I do know is we've got some fragments already here. So I have a header and I also have the products table there. So uh, this is IntelliJ presentation mode, by the way. So it's nice and light for us. We'll be able to see this. So what I want to do is let's add, oops, hang on, uh, Copilot. Uh, well, I'm using Copilot in here already. So so this is going to uh, this is going to try and prompt some things here. So I'm going to say something like add a header fragment. You can see the see. autocompletes coming up from a uh, code, a GitHub code pilot has already completed this. Um, this so that looks okay. good. That looks good to me. Yeah. Let's do some. Let's. Uh, what else do we need? We need a product table. So let's do another fragment for the product table itself. And hopefully we have like a nice banner at the top, which is the header, and then ah. list of the product table. Um, I think you probably need to fix although, uh, the although one thing, naming there. One thing that's very interesting here is what you'll notice with Copilot is what I asked for, I get. You can see I've asked for a product table and I've got a fragment called product table back. What I actually need is a products table fragment. So if I do that, exactly. now I get the products table. So you've got to be careful what you ask for because because uh, Copilot is going to give me exactly what I asked for. Okay, um, should we ship it? Should we have a look? Yeah, let's try it. Let's refresh. Uh, let's refresh Java, and you can see how lightning fast Java is going to be here. And uh, <laughs> restart this for almost as fast as JavaScript. Absolutely, and there, there you can see it's it, because this is a test. It's uh, it's populating this uh, these coffees and beers for me here. So if I come back here and refresh this page, amazing. There we go. So I have my header, which is this piece here. I have my search projects uh, products, and I can see my products with name description, how much it costs, plus the type. So I have some coffees here and I have some beers here. And each one has a, a unique primary key, which is the ID. And to think, Simon, you estimated this story as like two weeks on I know. right now. I know. Well, I had some holiday books. Come on, buddy. So come on, come on. <laughs> so, right, cool. shipped. Awesome. shipped. So here's the next task. Uh, we need to make that product table searchable. So we have that uh, search form. Uh, we want to uh, locate specific beers and allow users to search for a specific beer item that they want to buy from the product table. Okay. Um, so I have a search product here. If I was to do a search, maybe let's search on street or something like that. If I hit submit, I get no products found, despite the fact that I know that exists. Uh, and the reason is, if I come back here, uh, if I come, if I go to my uh, to my search repository. The reason is because this search product is null. And in fact, if I go to my home controller, um, I'll show you exactly how we're getting here. Uh, I have a, a post mapping here on slash endpoint, and that uh, that invokes this uh, search products method. It takes the request parameter, this input, this is anything I type into this search box, and it sends that directly through to this search product uh, input. Uh, you, you know, passing it into that method. So I, I get yep. input here directly from that box. So this is the this is the space I want to write some code, right? Definitely here. We want to implement this one. Uh, so and, uh, oh, let, let's see. So we see how good Copilot is. It's uh, it's very optimistic. Let's say it is very optimistic. It Absolutely doesn't know nothing. what to do. Crickets, <laughs> crickets, Loran, crickets. So what what do I need to do here, Loran? All right, so uh, we're getting, uh, I mean, I'll let you uh, go through this, but basically okay. you want to basically get uh, the input. Yeah. So you're going to get uh, maybe lowercase the input because we need to uh, find it in the in the database. Yeah. Let's see if yeah. it continues. Uh, yeah. Does it continue to do the rest of it? Well, what I want to do is I want to create a query uh, yep. that matches. So if I want to search matches the input oh there we go to the product name the product or name, the description yeah. okay so anything either either any any word in this or any yeah. word in the description that sounds good yep oh look yeah that looks good so let's take a look at what we do we create a native query we put that we put that into a query type uh we get a string back let's select star from product which is my table name uh mm -hmm. where the lower so it's lowered the description uh, is like lower input or lower product name is like lower input again. And it passes in that product class. Uh, so that looks good to me. Yeah, just get the results uh, here. Oh, look at oh this. there we go. Amazing. Return the results too. Go on, go on, go on. There oh, go. it did it, it did it. It did, yeah. There it is. 
I didn't okay. want to tell the audience how long you estimated this one, by the way. No, 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 don't, don't, don't. It's in 2024, I think it finishes. So I, I hit Roadmap. save. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's roadmap item, Q, Q1. Okay, so so I, I hit save and I refresh that. Um, again, Java being lightning fast, uh, this should be uh, here already. Let me refresh that as it refreshed. Yes. Um, okay, so now let me test something. Okay, I'm going to do a test on, let's have a look at something. Maybe ale could be a good one to, to do a test on. If I do a search there, oh, look at that. So we get Amazing. rumination, ale, ale, and it's also where it's not existing in the name. I see it in the description. This works, Loran. So um, what do we do when it works? I know what we do. We ship it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my changes. Let's select uh, both of these. Why is that not working? Oh, these are just the uh, the changes here. Uh, one. So well, uh, well, Simon adds all of this to uh -huh. uh, to the branch and and updates them. Uh, if you have ideas of maybe uh, what could potentially have gone wrong here, uh, you're welcome to add that into the chat, and uh, we'll get to it in a sec. But now, basically, what we're doing is we're adding those uh, to uh, those files to commit them, and uh, in a sec we'll uh, we'll get oh, this okay. shipped. So commit and push nine warnings. Oh dear, warnings are okay though, right? Yeah, yeah, no test either. We don't need that. No, absolutely. Okay, there's nothing there from a security <laughs> point of view. SQL injection, no, absolutely not. There's never a, there's never an SQL injection in my code. My code's perfect. Never. Let's push that. Okay, so that's two files committed and pushed. Let's go back to my Git repository. Uh, recent pushes less than a minute ago. Compare them and send a pull that's request us. back to my master. Okay, going from my that's branch good. to my master. Uh, let's create that pull request. I yeah. like how you don't need to add any uh, any description. That's it. Just Never. use it. Absolutely. Well, you know, uh, people the, the descriptions in the code, right? I don't need to. I don't need to do that. Um, so <laughs> interesting. People are saying there's an SQL injection and an unsanitized input in the SQL query. Uh, I wonder if I go back to my search repository. I wonder where you feel like that line uh, would be. What what is it that I'm uh, uh, doing? Just feel free to type in the the line number if you feel like you know where that might be. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh, look at that. Look at that. There's uh there's one check that didn't succeed, Simon here, and uh, that looks like a code check from Sneak. Maybe I uh, drill into the details to see what's going on. Twenty five as well says Ty. So let's take a look. If I dig into yeah. that. All right. So Sneak here, uh, just like uh, sitting there with GitHub Copilot, is helping us figure out what's going on with the code. It does uh, what's called as a SAS, a static application security testing, which checks uh, where, whether there are security issues in the code itself, not just in third-party packages uh, that we pop in with Maven, uh, but the actual code. So it looks like it found, um, what is this? An SQL injection, yes, high severity. And uh, congratulations everyone in the chat, Alex, Christopher, Ty, it looks like you are uh, spot on. Um, could you maybe uh, click on full details there? I wanna, I'm going to open this learn because I have no idea what an SQL injection is. Mm. So let me just quickly take a look. SQL, inje SQL injection is one of the most widespread code vulnerabilities. Uh, an attacker inserts or injects malicious SQL code via the input of the application. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Um, let's come back here. The full details, absolutely, yeah. Right, so we see now the actual code paths because Sneak is basically is on that repository on the code base. So it sees all the code and it is able to analyze, not just grab find, you know, specific uh, keywords, but actually analyze the code itself statically and understand the source of the input that users are sending. So they're, uh, you know, the, the username and, and uh, sorry, the, the product name and the description, how that flows through the code and from the source to the sync, which is basically the query itself being uh, created and submitted to the SQL engine behind the scenes. And what we're seeing here is that there is indeed an SQL injection because what's happening is that um, uh, potentially happening, we'll say it in a sec when we actually exploit this, we see that the user input, as you can see here, lower input, that variable there is actually flowed and used in and concatenated into the SQL query that we're running. Mm -hmm. So how do we fix this then? How do we, how do we add this sanitization? Um, I think there's like a fix analysis there. So there, maybe that gives us some clue into uh, seeing how to fix it. 
so this shows us some uh, uh, so this shows us several examples one of them is this one of other code repositories of how they fix it and we can see below it tells us you know you need to use a prepared statement you see a different project that is open source how they fix it so uh, there's these things called named parameters or prepared start statement which use uh, the named parameter uh, uh, you know methodology as well to actually tell the SQL engine, this is not part of the query itself that needs to get uh, evaluated, but our, this is a user input, a variable that needs to be replaced in. And then, you know, some of the answers here were saying, you know, unsanitized input in SQL query in the chat, and that's correct. That's what the SQL engine behind the scenes know what to do. So this is how we need to fix it. Um, do, you want to, okay. do, you, do you want us to hack it as well very quickly? Well, well let's let's try, yeah. Let's try hacking it. Okay, cool. Um, I'll paste something. I think you uh, might have that stored there, but um, I'll paste something here to the chat. Uh, but also, if you want to paste anything in the chat as well to show us uh, how to hack it. But essentially, what we want to do, one example here is if we're able to interact with the chat, what we may want to do, Simon, is uh, since I might want to buy one of those beers, I might want to just reset all of those prices to zero. So what I'll do is... Um, I sent you one of those in the chat. You can copy paste it or just push it into uh, into this into the uh, yeah into the search box here. So basically, we're saying we're gonna terminate. We're gonna terminate uh, this search field. Uh, then use a semicolon to say terminating the query itself. Then run a new uh, SQL query, update product, set price zero, and then use dash dash, which says uh, the rest of the query that is in the code is basically just a comment. So if you mm -hmm. send it. Okay, so that's been sent. And let me refresh the page now just to get refresh the updated the list. Great. Free beer, free coffee. Everyone this gets. A, this can't be a hack. I mean, it's got free beer and free coffee for everyone. This is only a good thing. <laughs> Indeed, you're in a meetup, so it makes sense. Absolutely. So what I want to do is let, let's get rid of this line then. This is the, this is the danger line. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's get rid of that. And let's 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 do this in a slightly different way this time then. So named query, no, named parameters. So create a query with named parameters right but let's try right. that okay so uh like input like input okay. seems to be okay both on the product Alex, and the description this time this time we're using name parameters and what was the other thing that you kind of mentioned i need to do a set name parameter yeah look at that there exactly we where input we need to set that it. parameter is now being this lower and put that is coming from my from my user so if mm -hmm. i save that and let's try and do that uh, that same thing. Absolutely, Christopher, best shop in town. There isn't a shop better. I tell you what, <laughs> the number of users and signups we would get, even though there's a vulnerability on it, would be amazing. Um, so <laughs> let's go back. Let's uh, let's come back here and let's try and do that same thing again. I'm going to copy what you sent me this time. Huh? Interesting. This time it doesn't uh, it, it do nothing with my with my price list. It actually says no products found, and presumably that's because what I passed in there is actually setting is actually sending this whole thing as a parameter as a string, and so as a result, no products match that string. And if I come back here, uh, my price is still is still there. So, uh, what do I need to do? Well, let's commit and push that back up to my repository. Uh, make sure I push that, um, and then what we'll do is uh, we'll come back over to uh, my PR check. Uh, let's get back to my uh, pull request. And now that's going to be running those tests again. And Simon, I... yes. let me ask you here. So you, you fixed that. Um, how do you feel about finding uh, security issues uh, this way? Well, I mean, it was good to find it before it hits production. But I tell you what, waiting for the waiting for it all to happen in um, in in a in a pull request seems a bit late. Yeah, I don't want I don't have to I push this across every single time uh, before getting this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's pretty cool we have it here. All of the CI checks here is a good way to kind of like create, uh, you know, a guard against all of those things coming in that might be vulnerable. But mm -hmm. could we find it earlier, like in the IDE, in code, even though everything here passed and this is now us fixing the SQL injection, we might want to give developers a better experience where they can actually find those security issues in the code. So Absolutely. let's move on maybe to the next. Yeah, let, let's do that on the next one. Shipped. Great. Amazing. All right, so the next one is we basically, so we, we so we have users in the coffee shop. Um, Simon did log in uh, with his own. Uh, what we basically want to be able to do is allow them to personalize their profiles, which means we want to allow them to upload their picture, their avatars, and set it up uh, so they have uh, 
they have their own picture there. So let's go back into the coffee shop, explain what's going on. So I'm going to log in. My part, my username is Simon. My password, don't tell anyone, 123123. If I log in, I bet Chrome look, telling me my password's so good. There we go. If I go to my profile, uh, I can scroll down. I can hit upload, choose file. Uh, let's grab uh, Simon Maple. Uh, there I am. Look at a wonderful, wonderful profile picture. Amazing. I hit upload Pretty image. Pretty person. But I hit, I hit upload image, nothing happens. If I go back to profile, <sighs> nothing is there. You know why, Laurent? Okay. Uh, let me guess. You need to implement that story too. Absolutely. You need a month. A month. Absolutely. Right? A mu at least. Minimum. Minimum. Uh, if I go to upload images, nothing happens here. I need to do this. So what do I need to do? Well, let me think. Um, so I get a file in. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to take that file. Uh, let's say save file. Oops. Save file to not my not the uploads directory but to the uploads direct, directory and the difference why it's not slash uploads it might even be slash uploads is because the upload directory is where i want it to uh, to be it does look like slash uploads uh, but just in case that changes okay so copilot is telling me Get the file, get the original name of the file name. And that will be Simon Maple, the, the, the Simon, I think it was Simon dash maple dot PNG or dot JPEG. Replace spaces with underscores. That sounds reasonable. Um, file name and path equals paths dot get and it concatenates the upload directory to my file name. That sounds great. Uh, and then do a file dot write uh, with the file name and path. Uh, and then, which is the uh, upload directory plus that uh, the file name, and then push all those wonderful bytes to it. And the thing I'm going to uncomment here, whoops, the thing I'm going to uncomment here is once that happens, I want to uh, first of all say the, is it called name? Yes, it is called name. Uh, upload, say uploaded images and provide that name back and then update the person in my person repository to say, um, to say, you know, when I go to that person, it pulls that it pulls that uh, image for me there. So that looks good, I think. Let me re-run uh, that and and quickly test it. This time yeah. when I test it, though, I'm going to do it in a Burp Suite browser because I got a feeling. I got this horrible feeling, Loran. You're going to tell me it's insecure <laughs> in a second. Um, so let me do that again and see what happens. Okay, what's my password? Uh, oh yes. See, that's why it's good to have bad passwords. Uh, okay, go to my profile. Let's upload, choose file. That file is Simon Maple, Simon dash maple.png, I think it is. Let's open that. Let's click upload. Right, it provides me with that success message saying uploaded images. If I go to Looks my good. profile, there I am. Amazing. Wonderful. There so we this go. works. This works. And in fact, if I go over to my HTTP history, I can even see the, the request and response that gets sent. And I can see my file name that I send. That's my original name. And I can see the file that I send. So tell me there's nothing wrong with this, Laurent. Uh, it's it's amazing. It doesn't look like anything is wrong. It's uh, just, just use it, push it to production. Do you want to do that? Or maybe okay, let's talk uh, about uh, it for a second. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Give me a code review. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. So, um, by the way, feel free to chime in, uh, you folks with us uh, in the chat uh, with any input you have on this. Uh, it looks to me like maybe we're uh, writing files not in the right place, uh, but uh, let's let's go and try maybe something else with the bird proxy. Let's try to actually uh, try and hack it and see through that and learn what was actually going wrong here. What do you think about that, Simon? Do you want to try yeah, that? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. Do we want to test first or do we want to try and hack? Um, Let's try and hack it. We just let's, let's try and hack it. Works. Okay. 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 Cool. So what could we do? So you have this. Uh, you have this upload request you're sent, and we can see if you can uh, highlight the file name Simon Maple there in the request. So we can see mm -hmm. that the the file name itself has been passed to your function, and it actually is based on this. It saves it on disk. Now what we want to do is maybe we we are able to now write to different files on on the server, not just in the uploads directory, but maybe something else. So what we could do is if you want to go back to uh, the the web app itself, we're going to try and maybe find if there are some interesting files there. 
um, static image. Oh, this is a static image on the top left coffee shop. There's like a sneak logo. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's copy the, yeah, the image address there. So maybe we can overwrite your picture with that one instead. And we'll have, uh, you'll be the, the CEO of sneak at this point. Uh, so um, let's, let's do it here. It's what you want to do on the request itself. If you yeah copy this image. Uh, yeah, that, that seems to be yeah. okay. Go yeah, back to our proxy true. and uh, yeah, just use a, you need to not place it here, but I'll actually uh, click, right oh. click that. Yeah, and make yeah, it, yeah. Uh, send it to the repeater send itself. It to the repeater first, don't I? And then in my repeater, now I can edit this. That's what I, that's what I. Yeah, that's a bird proxy uh, feature to allow us to basically uh, uh, replay requests back again with all of the cookies and everything saved. So we can save it here. Yeah, you don't need a whole uh, local host because it's just a file name, uh, but we do want to maybe uh, use a dot dot slash uh, batch traversal kind of notation because we want to go outside of the current directory um, into the top one. And I think you need to uh, just move that. Should you, is that on the same line itself? Uh, it is, yeah. I just double checked that okay. should be if I do that. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. We want to make, make sure that it doesn't have a carriage return mm -hmm. uh, or a line feeder. That looks okay. So we're basically now, uh, your code is if you send it, uh, let's see what happens. So uh -oh. it's upload success. Uh, but yeah, to a different place. And if you go to the top, yeah, HTTP 200. So that looks okay um, in terms of the hack itself actually worked. And if you refresh this page, maybe we'll see your picture there instead of the sneak logo. Oh, no. There we go. I'm famous, Laurent. Yes. Like I said, the CEO of the coffee shop and sneak. But uh, go back to the go back to the uh, IDE here. And I think that um, maybe you could have used this whole thing by yourself and you would not really need me to explain to you what was going on here. Do you want to show us why? Yeah, okay. Ah, so this is using sneak in the IDE. So what I can do from here is I can quickly scan the code here and see if there are any vulnerabilities that exist in my, in my code. And you can see this is the list of all vulnerabilities per uh, file or per class, per Java class uh, in, in, my, in my workspace here. And you can also see the squiggly lines on the IDE itself. So mm -hmm. as I'm writing code and testing, it's red, so it it's can bad. identify. Red's bad, or red's always bad, isn't it? Uh, let's take a look. If I open this, there's a path traversal. Okay, now we see that similar thing to, to what we did in the, uh, in the UI, right? We have something coming in, which in this case is a file. This is my user input, right? And it says here, unsanitized input, uh, from an HTTP parameter flows into into the files right where it is used as a path. This could be a path path traversal, which is exactly what we showed in the in the in the demo. So that path comes across here, or that file comes across here. That is then polluting the name variable. Uh, that then pollutes the file name and path because that's concatenated there, and it's the file name and path which then gets passed to the right. So this is this is the piece that is being polluted, right? Yeah, I think that's that's where things go bad. So maybe what we should actually do is uh, maybe let's. I mean, Copilot was helpful in again helping us code this, but uh, yeah. unfortunately, this ended up being an insecure code that it suggested. Um, yeah, you're going through like the the suggested fix by Sneak here, which is really cool because we can see what's the idea of how to fix it. So we need to use something that's called like get canonical path and start with, and there's like some validation being done on the file path itself before we write to it to make sure that it's in an allowed uh, path, like a scope directory that is allowed to be uh, uh, to be uploaded. So mm -hmm. do you want to use maybe, uh, I don't know, the GitHub Copilot um, prompt to ask it to validate or something like yeah. that? Yeah, so I'll say validate test file test name. File name and path is vulnerable. It's not vulnerable, so, maybe. Oh, it's not vulnerable, <laughs> yes. Uh, vulnerable to path traversal. <laughs> okay. I like that. Uh, uh, okay, let's say uh, sends you to learn. Maybe yeah. just validate. Maybe test, okay. move test, and use validate. Let's try this. I mean, this is not not deterministic, so we don't really know what's going on. Okay. So, what happens if uh, you use that and and try more? Would it complete more? Maybe, it? maybe what I have to say is validate file name and path is not vulnerable to path traversal. There we go. Let's see what nice. we have here. So if file name and path to file, so that gets me the file, get the canonical path of that file, make sure it starts with the upload directory. So what we're saying is once we've done that concatenation, does it start with the upload directory um, 
uh, so so is it in the directory or at least this is saying does it does the directory i'm putting it in start with upload directory the other thing uh that, that sneak is showing here is it wants it to kind of like also make sure it is that exact directory so plus file separator so i'll add that update there if that's okay um and if it is uh if it does not start with that then uh pass back an error uh, and return this person upload uh and then if we've if we've passed that then do the file right so i'm going to hit save um so here you can see upload controller here is uh, is is obsolete because we've made changes to it but let's see we have six vulnerabilities here and upload controller is one of them let's delete that rerun that and let's test if that vulnerability still exists there you can see we're back down to five and no directory traversal vulnerability uh, in this list as well so amazing and i know what you love most about this simon go on there's the Java. Fact that you found it. Yeah, it's Java, but you found it <laughs> right from the ID, right? Didn't need to wait for the CI to finish. Now I can go ahead and commit and push, and the vulnerability doesn't even make it into my Git repo. So as a developer, I'm doing this at the speed at which I uh, I want to test locally, and I'm I'm coding locally. So this is this is much nicer for me from a from a dev point of view. Hundred percent. Cool. So ship it. Let's uh, let's go back here. Uh, AI strange danger. Ship it. Done. What's next? Amazing. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and try to uh, customize those product pages so that we can actually navigate to them and, and, and not just search for them. We want to see the, the product details themselves. We want to be able to do that from within uh, the actual product uh, table listing thing. So mm -hmm. let's go back to the code. Okay. So actually, there's one thing uh, I can do here, which is very, very quick. And actually, I, I did notice someone had already done uh, part of this for me already. Mm. Uh, let me go back to the IntelliJ. Uh, and in my, what, what you noticed is in that table, I did use something called the products, uh, products table. There we go. Now, in this products table, I did notice someone uh, half, I think it was a, I think it was a, uh, uh javascript developer or someone because it was only half done it, uh, here <laughs> we go sense. here it is uh where we see the name passed in uh this one let me comment out that and comment out this one instead this one you'll see the name uh actually now has a has a direct link it's an anchor tag in here and it direct links me out uh, to a new page called uh or a new endpoint called direct which takes in param as a uh as a as a, a request parameter it uses the product name and that's where you know what it effectively does there under the covers is then pull out data from that product and 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 give me a unique page so let me save that reload that uh in hopefully there we go um and come back here and when this loads give it a quick second there we go uh, when that loads you will see now each of these have their own lovely little links and if i click on this let's say morning look if i click on that we see the direct param taking in my uh my product name and then it does a pull directly from the uh from the database pulling all the information so that's pretty much done right, right. <laughs> you wish <laughs> what's wrong so I mean, if we've learned anything is that uh, user input is dangerous and it looks like there's user input there, the parameter, the query parameter called param having a value of warning look flows back into the page itself where it's actually rendered in JavaScript. So mm -hmm. uh, that gives me the idea of like, you know, if I wanted to exploit this, I might set that to some JavaScript code, like, you know, script alert. So go yes. ahead and maybe uh, add that. Oh, I need to do another script here. Correct, open the tag, close it, alert. Uh, Something like this? That makes sense. Yeah, that works. Oh, there we no. go. Bad, because we were able to basically execute JavaScript on the page, right? So we could yes. steal the cookie and do those uh, you know, very dangerous things, like steal the cookie, send it somewhere else with an IJX request and all of those things. But so we have safe. a cross-site scripting here. This is safe, Ran. This is only running on my machine because if I come back here, this is always the product name. Mm hmm Amazing. Unless someone can change the product name, which like they did before in the uh, in the previous SQL uh, injection here, I might be able to say update the product set by product name is equal to the script alert one script where ID is a specific thing. So what that would do is that would change 
this to be that uh, that alert one and then anyone who clicked that would then get that uh, get that alert back up potentially taking their session data uh, and sending that to a to to a to a vulner- to a you know a, a malicious server or something like that that's exactly yeah. what that's exactly what attackers do as well right it's not a single hack it tends to be one hack after another hack after another hack and there's many vulnerabilities that will get an attacker to that to that uh, to that data no. Right, and I think not many people would know about like what to do here. So maybe they would venture into a different AI, uh, and you know try to f- you know review the code with a different kind of AI or an LLM to understand like maybe what is going on here because they may not be entirely sure what is wrong with the code that they use. Right. Absolutely. Now this is my this is and this is my code, right? Um, and I can see what I'm doing here is uh, as part of this request, I cr- I pass in uh, my my request parameter param. Uh, into this build product page, which then uses the product name, description, and all that, and builds this out as uh, you know direct uh, HTML, and it writes both the product name and uh, all of these out to the to the database. I guess this is missing validation as well, right? And if I take a look at this, this is exactly what Sneak is picking up uh, picking up here. Now, what I could do, of course, is I could send this directly uh, to to ChatGPT and say, "Is this code ready?" For for production chat GPT. And I pasted all my code in, uh, including uh, this build product page, uh, uh, passing this in. Um, and it tells me, well, uh, the code, oh no, what did I say? Is it production ready? Is this code ready for production? Um, and it gives me a, a ton of quite generic information, really saying error handling, security, ensure proper security measures in, is in place. Uh, implement authentication and authorization. So a little bit later after all, you know, sends me a ton of stuff i say tell me more about security is the code secure um and it gives me some various things it does mention cross-site scripting and it does say the code generates html manually in the build product page method and that's really interesting so i i kind of like dig a little bit deeper in there and say is there any cross-site scripting problem in this code and let's have a look at what it says well it says in the build product page we do have a, a push out to production Oh, sorry, out to out to that page, whereby we're writing various pieces uh, of of uh, object directly to that page, but it actually missed the biggest one. It missed the one mm-hmm. which is actually coming from that user input. The one coming from user input is this product name, right? And the product name here gets passed in as a parameter here from here. So in fact, I can click through here. The param it goes through the build product page into build product page and then out to the writer.write. So why could ChatGPT not pick this up? Um, and, and, and the reason, of course, is ChatGPT doesn't understand my code. It doesn't understand the code flows. And when we pass something through this method, when it changes its name from param to product name, yeah, ChatGPT didn't see that. It has no idea, right? Because it doesn't understand mm-hmm. these data flows. And so as a result here, it doesn't understand that this is user input. So very, very right. interesting. Um, so I say I need to defend against this. And it tells me exactly how I, as an attacker, should set up my server and send requests passing a document cookie from my page over to uh, over to my malicious server. So this is the script ChatGPT is suggesting I send. Of course, I ask for it to say, what would I need to do to, to defend against this? But very, very interesting that ChatGPT uh, sends this. Um, anything you want to add there, Laurent? Um, no, nothing here. I mean, there's the, the issue, of course, of uh, just generally speaking, the fact that uh, you actually had to send your code over. So I'm pretty sure you'll kind of cover talk about it, but uh, that's probably like not the best practice to do. We don't want to share uh, things like you know private intellectual property and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is something which, of course, uh, you know, many, many people think is safe or, or sometimes not know it's not safe, but they want something uh, that they, they want some output from ChatGPT. And so they just send snippets and things like that. But uh, but yeah, this is uh, this is obviously, sh- you know, sharing out our IP and our sensitive data, which uh, which is something I don't I don't want to do. Yeah. OK, so let's wrap up. Implement all of this. We are, we are shipped. The ship at Squirrel and the success. Amazing job, Simon. 
Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good. Uh, okay, so just a few slides uh, to go. And if there's any questions, by the way, uh, feel free to drop it into the Q&A and around. Maybe you can start monitoring that in, yeah. the, in the last few we slides. We have a couple of those. Um, we have a couple already wonderful. So yeah, feel free to add any questions uh, into the Q&A and we'll go through those in just a second. But from a learnings point of view, how do we approach AI-assisted development uh, in terms of a secure uh, point of view? First thing is really, when you are allowing your development teams to use generated AI and to use uh, AI, um, AI-enabled code completion, education and awareness is absolutely core. First of all, saying what you are and aren't allowed to use, uh, what you can and can't do, particularly from an IP point of view and just a product point of view. Are you allowing Copilot use? Are you allowing uh, uh, ChatGPT? And is it uh, the ChatGPT that is enterprise ready, that allows uh, no training off of it in, in, and you know the, the SOC 2 style uh, compliant uh, environments and deployments. Um, so focus on security vulnerab uh, vulnerabilities, focus on uh, IP data, uh, focus on um, hallucinations and things like that. Get people aware of these kinds of things. Uh, and, and secondly, human interaction is important, whether through automated tooling, through validating third-party libraries actually are real that AI is suggesting for you. Don't trust. Make sure everything is verified and validated, whether through a tool like Sneak, where it's automated into the IDE, the Git repo, the CI, or, or whether it's a code review. Uh, make sure you have uh, good policy and, and, and policing to make sure that whatever is generated goes through these levels of, uh, these levels of testing. And make sure that what you use to test is fit for purpose. Chat GPT and things like that, they, they, they might look like they're good, but they don't understand the code. Make sure you use something that understands the data flows, uh, the, the flow of control uh, through the programs and things like that. AST tools do this very, very well. Uh, and for some further reading, uh, there's a couple of uh, a couple of best practices that uh, uh, or, or cheat sheets that I wrote. One around securely developing with AI, both from the AI-assisted uh, uh, um, development uh, as well as applications, as well as the AI models themselves. And the second one here on the right hand side is a, a top 10, which OWASP created around securing LLMs themselves. Uh, and this goes from everything from you know, prompt injection to denial of service, supply chain, uh, particularly around training data and things like that. There's a huge amount there. And this is um, a cheat sheet that I wrote uh, for that as well. Uh, if you saw Sneak and you'd like to try this, uh, you can try it for free as well. Well, uh, the sneak. This is sneak code, which we uh, which we shared. We obviously also test things like open source code, uh, uh, open source libraries. We also test uh, infrastructure as code and containers as well. This was just one piece that we showed uh, today. Um, and yeah, feel free to try that out. It's uh, it's it's free for use as well as paid plans as well. And you can try out the the, the sneak extensions in the IDE. I used IntelliJ. We support the JetBrains. Uh, group of IDEs, as well as others, including VS Code, Visual Studio, Eclipse, and many, many more. So feel free to try that out. And uh, yeah, thank you very, very much for, for your attention. And uh, please do add your add your questions in. Uh, Laran, any any questions that you uh, that you have? Uh, that, yeah, we've got uh, a couple of those here. So okay. I, I think I'll show one of them. So that, mm. uh, Phil, I'll read through it for everyone too. For existing code bases, AI can have a hard time ingesting, in my experience, which overwhelms it. Using it to create new code seems easier on the whole, but that's not the most projects we encounter. So the question being, how have you worked with existing large projects and used the power of AI to help move it forward? Yeah, um, this is this is a great question. It's all about context, right? And I think you know various different tools exactly. and AI generation tools. They sometimes the more information you give it, the the harder it will find to actually you know, pick out the relevant pieces. Um, there are there are I, I know there are certain different amounts of context you can you can create. And in fact, some of the announcements with ChatGPT, OpenAI just recently talked about you know GPT four Turbo and things like that having much greater. Uh, context, uh, in fact, much greater amounts of code that it can that can ingest. Um, the way one of the ways Copilot works is using um, neighboring tabs, which kind of doesn't necessarily learn context around everything in your in your project or everything in your Git repo, certainly. But it, what it looks at is also what tabs you have open, and it can learn from that in terms of providing you uh, with a better um, with a better better fit but more relevant code suggestion to your project uh so yeah i i would say that's probably still one of its weaknesses in terms of being able to provide uh context relevant uh advice but it has got a lot lot better and i'm thinking in terms of copilot they saw i saw on a on a 
um, on a news group somewhere, someone said, uh, I think it was one of the community leads said when they use neighboring tabs, the the number of accepted suggestions almost doubled. So it, this is this is a really relevant piece yeah. for them. Um, anything you wanted to add on to that as well, Laura? No, I think that kind of nails it. Um, I also think it's I would see I would see kind of like code tools like GitHub Copilot as assisted development rather than you know ingesting uh, you know tens of lines uh, tens of hundreds of lines of code. Of a, of a code base and telling you what to do. It's more like, you know, you want to implement something, you want to change, refactor, fix, write a test. And it's still very scoped, even if you have, uh, if there are some adjacent files and then you open them in different tabs, like uh, like Simon was saying. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Next question. Um, does sneak check for things such as uploading an image without stripping the metadata, example, location or owner, or is this too implementation dependent? Yeah, um, no, great question. Um, sorry, did you want to take that one, Laurent? I was going to, I don't think we do. Yeah, my, my take is I, we don't specifically look at this kind of like business logic things. Like, you know, if you are stripping a location owner, whatever other header or metadata you have. Uh, but for example, what we might catch is if you are extracting it and you're using like the image metadata, like location, and then passing it over to save that in the database or, I don't know, running a, a process like a command um, command uh, uh, process that you spin, uh, you know, spin off based on that location or owner or something from the image, then that data, data is passed through. This is basically the source to the sync problem that we've seen with SQL injection. And those we are more likely to actually catch. Um, you can actually even write, you can kind of like program the, the, the sneak uh, code things with your own uh, policies and like how to, you could actually have those in place too if you wanted to. Um, I yeah. think so that's the, right. That's like, even if you wanted to add like business rules, which I think is like less common to do, but you could probably do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Custom rules is absolutely a thing. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Laran, with the with the source and sync. So what we would do is we would recognize if you're pulling metadata from a user in, user provided uh, file, that file is user input. So if you're pulling metadata, that is user input. But we'll only flag it if it gets to a sync point with, whereby something can be exploited if there is no sanitization between the source and sync. So yeah, that that that's what mm -hmm. we. Uh, everything else is is more a almost like a quality or a best practices uh, style. Uh, policy maybe that you would want to uh, add in in another way, but from a security point of view, it's only insecure when you hit the um, uh, when you hit the the sync point. And a question just came in, Loran: Is it possible to use the free version of Sneak integrated with an ED, IDE like Visual Studio Code? And yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can. I think it's uh, free for all as long as you just create a create create yourself a uh, a free account on our freemium tier. And it's not a it's not a trial. It's a freemium tier account. Um, and then yeah, just go download your Visual Studio Code, uh, your VS Code. In fact, it's um. Yeah, it's, get the extension from the marketplace this, right? from the ID itself. Yeah, yeah, this, is it. th this one is the VS Code one. So yeah, just just go to the marketplace, grab the uh, grab the sneak code extension. You'll need to auth. That'll be your auth key, and it's from your freemium uh, install. And yeah, you're good to go. You can you can start testing straight away. Sounds amazing. Simon, I have one last question. That is, uh, where do I get uh, a pin to put like here for like a Java developer after I've done this session with you? Where do I get that? Where, where do you get what? Sorry, I need a pin on my shirt. That says a Java developer that I'm now certified after I've done this session with you. Do, do you know? Do you know the pin? It's actually you know to have a clothing pin. That's very materialistic. What you have now, Loran, is a pin in your heart, and and that tells you truly you are a Java developer. So so put the JavaScript behind you now, Loran. Thank you so much. You, you're a converted Java developer now, and it's it's a pleasure. To, it's a pleasure to have you on the. On the on the not is it the dark Definitely. side or is it not the dark side? I don't know, but uh, yeah. <laughs> bye bye JavaScript. Wonderful, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Duran. It's been a great pleasure. It's been a great pleasure chatting with you, and uh, and thank you everyone for both contributing on the on the chat and the and the Q and A. Um, and we'll pass over now back to the Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Loran and Simon, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.